LC Schultz is a recovering, my finger quotes, band geek who spends most of her time talking about what the future and social justice with students as a career counselor. When she's not doing that, she's trying to change the world by sharing really, really, sometimes overly, personal stories with strangers to trick them into giving her theirs. She's lived in five states, calling San Diego home for almost two years, and there's nowhere she'd rather be here tonight than with you. Please welcome Kelsey Schultz. When I was a kid, I used to get so excited I would throw up. My mom first noticed this when I was four at my brother's second birthday party. She found me bawling and throwing up in the corner because watching my brother slowly open his presents was too much anticipation for me to handle. <sighs> Attention deficit hyperactive disorder. I have ADHD. Getting overstimulated became a common occurrence, and my parents remained vigilant to prevent my episodes. For example, I wasn't allowed to open the mail in case we got an invitation to an event. <laughs> and when we went to Disneyland, they just didn't tell me until we were there, <laughs> or my head would have exploded. It, it was a lot to handle. But this was the beginning of my lifelong journey, trying to figure out how to be myself and find belonging and even love without a filter or a compass for normal. When I started school, my parents decided to put me on medication. Pills helped me manage my beautiful Ferrari brain with bicycle brakes. But it wasn't a prescription for belonging, which still felt like such an unattainable goal after so many failed attempts at trying to make friends. My senior year, I transferred high schools because it had a better band program and a better commute, all these boring reasons, but I was waiting alone in the lobby for an appointment with my guidance counselor. That's when a group of guys waltzed in and turned my world upside down. One of the guys waltzed in and sat in the seat right next to me. I felt confidence radiating off of him. Hey, I haven't seen you around before. Are you a freshman? Welcome to Cheney High School. The remaining four guys filled in the rest of the seats in the lobby, surrounding me. They were raptly engaged in this weird conversation. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm a senior. I just transferred here. That's why you wouldn't know me. I'm Kelsey, by the way. Huh, the first guy responded, Kelsey, you're a senior, you need friends, and you're not a dude. Perfect. We're going to call you Token Chick. We're the mod squad. I'm Max, by the way. <laughs> Max then introduced the rest of the mod squad. We're going to lunch soon, but we'll wait for you, Token Chick. Take your time. <laughs> that was it. That was my initiation as Token Chick into the mod squad this group of senior boys that grew up in this small town together. Max quickly became my best friend because this group did everything together my senior year. Max was my best friend though because he constantly pushed my boundaries. Like, oh, does curfew really matter if we're just gonna go see this movie? Come on, token chick. Or is it really speeding if we're going down these back roads that nobody cares about? I mean, we live in the middle of nowhere. And of course, they were ever grateful for their built-in designated driver because I was too responsible to do anything. <laughs> but yeah, so the mod squad was everything to me. And sexual tensions, I know you're wondering, they were not an issue because the guys were always in a relationship and I had this massive crush on a guy in band, so nothing was gonna get in between that. It was perfect and we had so much fun together, but Again, like I would have done anything to protect my spot in that group and take care of the guys. And I know they would have done the same for me. Being token chick was the perfect confidence booster graduating high school and moving across the state, away from my family and from them. My first night in college, I knocked on every single door unabashedly in my residence hall. 
hi, I'm Kelsey. You're new. I'm new. Let's be best friends. Let's hang out in the lounge. And as I saw this herd of people run down the stairs into the lounge, I started to see my energy as a strength for the first time because I could break the ice so easily. In the lounge, this girl with pretty blonde hair and glasses walked up to me. Hey, I see you're playing a game of spoons. Um, I'm Ellie. I live on the second floor. I think we live together. I don't know, but can I play? That was the beginning of my friendship with Ellie and the girls on my floor who quickly bonded together. But Ellie and I grew particularly close because I really looked up to her. She seemed way cooler than I ever was and way more cultured with boys and sex and drinking and even travel. And I just couldn't get enough of her stories. And with the girls, we would create these elaborate plans for things like elaborate plots for how to get the phone number of this guy in class that I really wanted to talk to more. It was a lot of fun, but after finally making groups of friends, I started to think that maybe I could be myself and even be loved for it, which I'd never had before. That first year in college, the squad went on many road trips to come and visit me, crashing in my dorm room. When I finally introduced the squad to my college friends, Max and Ellie really hit it off. My two best friends, dating long distance, it was actually pretty perfect, and I was really excited to see them so happy together. But that only lasted a few months. Then Ellie broke up with Max right before summer break. During Fourth of July weekend, I was camping on my family's property with the squad. We were having a great time, but in the middle of the night, while I was asleep, Max drunkenly falls on my cot and just starts mashing his face into mine. No consent, nothing. That was my first kiss. In the morning, Max looked at my bruised lips and said, we're cool, yeah? Well, it wasn't romantic or with a guy I'd imagined or waited for, but maybe that wasn't realistic. How would I know? So I said, sure. It felt wrong to keep this a secret. So I called Ellie and I told her what happened. Ellie took a moment on the phone. She paused and said, you had to have known that I still had feelings for Max. You broke girl code and I just can't, I just can't do this with you. Don't call me again. And she hung up. I felt terrible and like I'd done something wrong. I sent her flowers trying to get her back, but she refused to talk to me again. When Max found out, Max said I ruined his chance at getting her back. So he cut me off too. And I didn't see the squad again. I was devastated because I believed them. I believed that this was all my fault, and if I'd just known better, I would have done better. I was devastated, abandoned, and wary of making mistakes again. They didn't talk to me for two months. My sophomore year of college began, and things actually did seem to settle in my world. Until one night, when my phone exploded with texts. It was Max. Kelsey Schultz, you would be the best booty call ever. I can't believe I didn't see what was right in front of me these last two years. If I had a time machine, I'd go back and do things very differently this summer. This could be a chance for you to blossom into the woman I know you want to become. Just come home. I want to be with you. But let's keep this between the two of us. You owe me that after all. What the fuck? After everything that happened, I mean, yeah, if I had a time machine, I'd go back and do things very differently this summer, but the But this is Max, someone 
I thought I lost forever. Someone I trusted, deeply cared about, and would do anything to have back in my life again. If there was even a chance that we could talk and fix things, and maybe things could go back to the way they were, how could I pass that up? And besides, who would want you? A geek, a spaz, and a virgin, I thought. He knows you and wants you. So I said yes. I kept my promise and told no one about our plan. A few weeks later, I drove 400 miles across the state of Washington, six hours in the car. <sighs> and as I showed up, we had a stiff hug, stilted small talk. It was very awkward. We walked into his tiny, filthy dorm room, sat on the bed, and watched a shitty Japanese horror film in complete silence. Not touching. Romantic. As the final credits rolled, I asked Max if we could talk, because it just felt so weird, and I'd come all this way. He stared at me intensely, cocked his head to the side, and tucked a strand of hair behind my ear. And he just said, you don't want to hurt my feelings, do you? Why is he acting so weird, I thought. Immediately countered with the thought, can you just chill? Remember, you owe him. So aloud I said, I just want to make you happy. That's why I came all this way. I just want things to go back to the way they were. Max grabbed the back of my head and crushed his mouth against mine again. Then he pinned my wrists together and pushed them above my head. I felt the weight of his body as he pulled himself on top of me. This isn't what I imagined, I thought, immediately countered with you and your childish fantasies. <laughs> this is what you wanted. Sex. Focus. You don't even know what you're doing. Just be in the moment. My internal battle for control waged on. But as my last piece of clothing fell to the floor, I froze. Floating outside of my body, I heard someone else ask Max in my voice, what am I supposed to do? Max was angry and frustrated because he couldn't get it up. So Max said, it's literally the most natural thing you can do. God, what's wrong with you? Ignoring my tears, Max roughly forced himself inside of me over and over again, shoving me into many positions. I closed my eyes and retreated into the recesses of my mind. He finished. You know, that feeling, being a black hole. I'm empty. Numb. The next day, on the long drive back to my college campus, my thoughts continued to keep me company. Great, this is what you wanted. You're not a virgin anymore, but who will love you now that you are sucking at sex? What kind of freak doesn't know how to have sex? Max is right. This is your fault, and you just keep screwing it up. Many hours later, I parked. I walked into the dorm room that was so quiet and still. I crawled underneath my comforter, which smelled like lavender, and tried to get some sleep. But images and flashes of the night before just seared behind my eyes over and over again. My stomach clenched, and I grabbed a pillow. I let out hollow, bellowing screams, almost like vomiting up deeply buried truth. Today, almost eight years after I was first sexually assaulted, I'm still learning how to trust my internal compass. 
I've come a long way in learning how to accept that lonely little girl who used to get so excited that she'd throw up. But I've still got some work to do to figure out how to accept that part of me that still aches and misses the mod squad. Even after everything that happened, and even if it doesn't make sense, that part of me is still there, and I don't exactly know what to do with it yet. The only thing I know for sure, though, is if I'm really looking for belonging like I have this whole time, I have to accept myself first, and I have to become my own best friend. So I'm never going to stop fighting to figure out how to accept all those parts, messy and all, because I believe that we deserve a world where everyone feels safe, loved, and belongs just for being who they are. Give it up for Kelsey, everybody.